Well, should we go ahead and get started? Anyone uh, have a friend they're waiting for or something? Any reason to delay? No? Very good. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Kevin Nilsson, and I'm the lead technical solution engineer um, at Google. And so what my job is, I work with all the partners, all the great content you see on Chromecast. So things like HBO, Hulu, Netflix, Pandora, Major League Baseball, ESPN. Uh, all these partners, I work with them to make them uh, be successful on getting their apps out the door. So uh, sometimes it's troubleshooting uh, over the phone, sometimes it's over Google Hangouts, uh, other times I get on a plane and, uh, and fly in and, and, and help them move forward and answer all their questions. So, um, How many of you own a Chromecast? All right, so this is a Chromecast, if you haven't seen one, seems like just about everybody, 35 bucks, they're really nice. So. Cool. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, so here's a couple of couch potatoes, kind of leisurely enjoying. Uh, we all love kind of watching TV, uh, relaxing in the living room. Uh, but it's not just about leisure. It's about spending time with your family, your friends, uh, you know, sharing experiences together. And uh, people really enjoy it. And, you know, the average people today are spending about three hours or over three hours. Uh, in front of the television every day. And so it's a really huge uh, opportunity, and it's a huge opportunity we have with the boom in mobile and this, the, the, the time in front of the television and kind of bringing the multi-screen experience to make the television experience better for folks. Uh, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. So this is Chromecast. And it's, uh, you know, if you notice in the title of the talk, I talk about Google Cast uh, rather than Chromecast. Chromecast is one piece of hardware. Uh, so this is it. Um, it connects into your TV uh, via HDMI, similar to like a Blu-ray or any other thing that you plug into your television. It supports CEC, so it can, uh, when you start casting things, it will switch over to this input on your television. And it's really cheap. Um, so in the US, it's only $35. Uh, it's been a really, really big hit. Um, I know on Amazon, it's uh, been the number one electronic for about a year uh, for all their electronics. So if, uh, the adoption is really, really huge. And if you don't have one already, you should check it out. And definitely today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about enabling web applications for Chromecast. And so hopefully you'll see, get some basic understanding and uh, be intrigued to jump out there and get started. Um, so one of the things that we wanted to do with Chromecast is make an ecosystem that's very familiar to people, right? So I'm sure none of you have seen a car that looks like this before, uh, but all of you would probably feel fairly comfortable to step into it and drive it, right? Things are in common places, it's very familiar, um, and, and with Chromecast, we're leveraging your phone for most of, the, most of the heavy lifting. So the navigation, things like that, it's using iOS, Android, or the, the basic web browser in Chrome. Um, and so we really want that familiar experience for people, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, we also want to keep it really simple, and that's another one of the main philosophies, is making a, a simple experience for folks uh, with a very streamlined UI, uh, simplicity, rather than having to learn another remote, uh, just leveraging your phone um, to be that. And finally, making it powerful. Um, with, a, with a Chromecast uh, basic experience, everyone in this room could be connected to a television. All of you could have the ability to modify a playlist. All of you could have the, mod the ability to pause, scrub videos, and uh, have this very po powerful collaborative environment where rather than most, most homes that have uh, one remote control in the living room, everyone in the room who has any kind of a device uh, gets that power. So Google Cast um, is this unique experience that takes the highly immersive 17-inch world, which is your phone, and you all like you know, the great the preferences and things that are here. Uh, you're all very familiar and very immersed with this. And then you also have the 10-foot, very comfortable um, experience, uh, kind of a lean-back experience. You're sharing with others. It's not just yourself. Um, and what Chromecast is trying to do and the Google Cast is trying to do is to bring these two worlds together um, and give a, a new experience uh, with a second screen. And so the first screen being your phone and the second screen being up on the television. 
So now I want to go ahead and talk about the Google Cast SDK, um, SDK for, for developers, and we'll, we'll get started uh, with a little bit about that. Um, so all of you are familiar with a basic remote for controlling a television. Um, and how many of you have, have lost your remote control maybe this week, right? So at my house, I know I have a pile of five remotes. Uh, when someone comes in new, they don't know which one to use, how to use it, and, and often my, my TV viewing ability is, is limited to one channel because I can't find my remote, uh, either due to my wife or kids, you know, something's uh, lost somewhere, right? Um, another great product that's been launched is Android TV, right? So at Google I.O., we announced Android TV. Uh, it's a really great device. Uh, that lets you build native applications, um, but all Android TVs will come with Chromecast uh, built-in support. So you can cast to those uh, televisions and set-top boxes at the same time. So they kind of support both platforms at once, and so any work that you do um, for Chromecast will work on all Chromecast and Android TV devices. So. One of the nice features of Chromecast is that it works on uh, many, many platforms. So here you can see uh, an example of Android, iPhone, tablets, browsers, all connected up to the same television. And they're all able to, to scrub and they're able to adjust the volume and change the playlist. And it all is controlled through the Chromecast, uh, a single, uh, you know, all of them connecting at the same time and manipulating as if they were remote. So let's talk about some of the technology and some of the terminology that we're going to use today. Um, so Google Cast is a technology where Chromecast is the first piece of hardware um, to support that, right? Um, so Cast is a technology, and so I talk a lot about Google Cast and, and Cast enabling your app. Um, but Chromecast is a piece of hardware um, that uh, has, has led things off and has been really, really successful. We've got two um, types of apps that we'll write. There'll be sender applications, which would be like your Android, iOS, or web browser. And you'll have receiver. And that's the, fo the, the code that runs in the dongle. So this is actually a Chrome browser. Uh, it actually has you know, real Chrome in it. You can think of it as a single tab Chrome browser. Um, and this is where the, all the code that goes in the television is. And so it's a really simple uh, HTML5 experience you get here, CSS, JavaScript, HTML5, and it's, it's real Chrome. Uh, and so it's a, it's a really easy platform for folks uh, to code with. You don't have to learn anything new or uh, any other challenges there. And the, the last term I'll talk about is casting, and that's the, the act of sending code up to your television. So let's talk about how, how Google Cast works. Uh, so imagine you're sitting at home and you're watching YouTube on your Android phone. Um, and you're, you're watching on this small screen and you look up and you say, wow, I've got a television there. I wish I could watch that experience at the 10 foot experience uh, up on my wall on a large screen. And then you remember, you've got a Chromecast device on your television. You look down to your phone, you see the cast icon, you click it. And then it, your phone actually connects out to your television. And then what happens is it reaches out to YouTube, and then you see YouTube on your television. And so now, so now you've transitioned very easily from your phone uh, out to watching on the television. Now what happens is you're actually streaming YouTube from the cloud. It's not going through your phone. It's not eating up your data plan. It's not eating up your battery. It's going directly from the cloud uh, out to your phone. Then later, when you do want to either change a video, adjust the volume, uh, make any of these other, you know, change a playlist, uh, your phone would actually connect back to the dongle and, and make those changes. So it's very simple, like a web socket connection uh, between the phone and the, and the Chromecast. Uh, but like I said, it's, it's only for doing commands like changing videos, pausing, uh, scrubbing. It's not for actually streaming the content. Uh, so you get, you know, you're not going to eat up your battery and you're not going to uh, eat up your data plan. So now I want to talk about some basic tips for coding for the television. 
And this is going to apply to lots and lots of platforms, be it a Roku, an Apple TV, uh, Android TV, wherever it is. I want to include something for everybody. And these are some basic tips uh, that, that you can leverage on Chromecast as well, obviously. Um, so here's the first kind of simple web page. And this is something I, I threw together on my desk uh, last week. Um, so we see a simple web page that says, hello, cast developer. But then if you look at the, at the screen, the television screen, uh, most of the text is cut off. Does anyone know uh, why that's the case? We have one. Anyone else? Yeah, a few. Want to tell us? Yeah, overscan. So overscan is exactly what happens. Um, so when you look at this, um, you know, this is from my desk, and this is my, my TV in the default out-of-the-box configuration. Uh, so by throwing something up there with some basic text, uh, it's all cut off. And what, what happens is, uh, here you can see some suggestions from the BBC, and this is from some older standards where, you know, TVs don't render well around the, the edges, um, you know, various kind of wrapping around the corners. Um, so here's something off of Wikipedia from the BBC that talks about um, different aspects ratios and, and what percentage of the screen that you need to leave um, with no content. And so if you, if you think back to like movies you've watched or maybe you'll pay attention in the future, you'll notice that like actors' faces are never near the sides of the screen. They're usually kind of centered up a bit. And it's the same for, for Google Cast um, or, or any other thing that you're writing software for any sort of messages you want to display, things like that, you need to inset them with some borders and stay away from the, the, the outer probably 15% so that uh, things continue to look nice. Um, another thing I'll talk about is, is the whole second screen, right? So a lot of times people, uh, you know, with like Chromecast or other things, uh, when they're developing second screen applications um, that could list could exist in a single screen. Uh, they'll end up putting dialogues, error messages, uh, many things like this up on their television, right? Um, and so you have to really think about the fact that when you do introduce something like a second screen, uh, folks are looking at their, at their phone. They're looking at their second screen or their first screen, uh, not the television. And so, uh, you know, clicking and things like that should, should happen here uh, rather than up on the television. And the last thing I'll, I'll leave you with is burn-in, right? So does anyone, so here's a, like an airplane terminal, and you can hardly read any of the text uh, because the screen's been burnt in, right? And I'm sure many of you have seen computer monitors uh, many years ago, CRT screens that had this. Uh, but does anyone know in, in modern televisions where this is uh, a huge, huge problem? Anyone? What's that? Plasma TVs. So plasma TVs are really, really bad at burn-in. And they, people pay lots of money for them and they get really upset. And do you know, anyone know how long it's recommended to leave something up on a screen? Do you know? Five minutes, that's, that's the very, uh, that's the conservative number that I tell most people. And so after five minutes of leaving something up on the screen, uh, it'll start to burn in the pixels. Um, and so obviously the longer you leave it, the more and more it gets burnt in. And so where this is important to, to things uh, in the media space would be, you know, imagine you pause a movie. After five minutes, you need to no longer be pausing the movie. You need to jump to some sort of a splash screen. Or when your movie's finished, you need to have some sort of interactive background sequence, um, like a splash screen. It's showing various content. Otherwise, this is what's going to happen to your to your users. Uh, you have to be careful on those splash screens uh, for things like logos, making sure that they jump around. Yeah. So if you create a game with a, a background. Yeah, it's probably bad for people. So some people do like weird pixel shifting and things like that. Some of the newer plasma screens actually shift by one pixel um, all the time. But you could do the same thing, I think, with your game to kind of move things around a little bit. Um, but definitely keep that in mind as you're progressing through levels or whatever it is where you're, you're switching um, the content and the colors and things. Uh, we don't really have any APIs that are specific to that at this time. Um, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's all, it's just a Chrome browser. Um, so it's not that hard to do that. 
one pixel shifting is already sufficient. Yeah, yeah. A lot of TVs will do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they change the color as well. So, yeah. So now I want to talk about the design checklist, right? So we've got a really extensive design checklist um, in, in Chromecast that really tells folks about how to build apps, right? But I want to I kind of step back and talk at, at a higher level about how Google thinks about uh, design checklist, right? So those of you who are, are in kind of mobile development, you're familiar with you submit an app to Apple, and then they reject it and say, you know, we don't like this because it doesn't follow the design guidelines. And then you submit again, and eventually you get it right, and they put your app in the store. At Google, we actually let you put an app in the store uh, without passing our guidelines, right? Uh, and we kind of leave it up to users. If they find your app confusing or whatever it is, um, it, it, it probably won't get rated that high and won't get that many usages. But one kind of really key piece of information I want to tell you all is if you are like an Android developer and, you, and you're always wondering why isn't my app ever featured, um, this could be one of the main, main reasons. So Google doesn't feature apps uh, that aren't fully checked for compliance with their style guide. Um, and so if, if you have a great app out there that has tons and tons of downloads, but you're not using an action bar, you're not doing any of those types of things, um, you know, if, if it doesn't feel like an Android app, it feels like an iPhone app, or it feels like some other unusual thing, uh, you're definitely not going to get featured. So take that as like a, a lesson learned, that if you are doing mobile development um, in, in Android, definitely you know, read this and read the, the Android guide very clearly and follow it as best you can. Uh, we do the same thing in Chromecast, uh, where we really want folks, when they come in to use your app, they know exactly how it's going to behave, they know exactly uh, what to expect, and it should feel very intuitive uh, from other apps that they've used before yours. So here's some, some simple examples of our design guide, where we show um, about how the, here we're showing how the cast icons should behave when you don't have devices on your network, uh, when you do, uh, when you're connecting, it's animating, and then finally when you're connected, it's uh, filled in. So that's some examples. Uh, here's some others uh, where we've actually showing uh, when people are selecting which device to connect to, because we think at the, you know, at the $35 price range, a lot of people are putting multiple devices in their home. And so here you can see some of that. And uh, finally, these are all the various things that are covered. Uh, menus and controls, notifications, lock screens, uh, all these things are very well specified, uh, how they should behave, uh, so that you get a consistent uh, behavior among all cast applications. And uh, here's information about the icon. We actually provide the icon with you. Um, and what I'll show in, uh, here next is folks can uh, use the icon in different ways where they can uh, style it however you want to fit your application. Now let's talk about the cast SDK, right? So I'm going to start with senders. So senders would be, uh, in the web world, would be the Chrome browser uh, running, you know, on your laptop or desktop. Um, and other senders obviously are Android and iOS, but today I'm just going to talk about Chrome. So the, the Chrome sender, uh, most of the heavy lifting is done in the Chrome extension. So there's a Chrome extension uh, that does almost everything for you, and you just pull in a very small JavaScript library uh, that, that connects to that extension. Uh, the extension, you know, the, the code itself, um, you know, obviously is HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, because it's just running in your browser. And you just include one small uh, JavaScript file that you see down there at the bottom, um, and that like, basically communicates with the Chrome extension. So now let's talk about the code. Right? Uh, the first thing you'll do um, is you're, you're trying to determine if there are devices on your network. And so you're going to register a, a callback there, the on-cast API available. You'll, read, you'll add that to the window object so the extension can call you. And if it does get called, you'll call initialize your cast API. And uh, with that, you can create a session request, right? Oops. So, uh, with a session request, uh, you're going to pass your application ID, which is an, an ID for your application, and then you've got a, 
uh, request listener, a join listener to tell you when people have, have joined and left, and a, and a receiver listener. And then finally, you'll call initialize, right? That has a success and a fail callback. Um, in that listener, the receiver listener, this is what tells you if there are devices available on your network. And so if you think back before, we showed the UX guideline where it shows without the cast icon or with the cast icon. This is where you make that decision about whether or not to show the cast icon uh, on your page. So it tells them, do they have the Chrome extension installed, and do they have a device on the network? Uh, the next thing that you'd want to do is request a session. So if someone clicks on the icon that you added to the screen, you want to request a session, right? You want to connect to that Chromecast. And so here you do that. Uh, you'll add a, a listener uh, in, a, in an error callback. Um, so with the success listener, um, we can show. And then what, what you'll do when someone does connect, you'll often want to load a video and play it, right? So the first step that you'll do is create a load request uh, with a, a media info object, that's a domain object, uh, around a piece of media. And you'll specify its URL and MIME type so it can be played. And then you'll load it. And that basically loads it up. Um, but doesn't have it playing. It, it gets it loaded into the player and ready to be played. And then when that is successful, you can finally call play, pause, seek, um, all those on the media session. So you keep that media session around. So it's really, really simple um, to write a sender, right? So now I want to talk about the code that runs in the receiver, that runs in the dongle, right? Um, the dongle is, is regular HTML5. It's a Chrome browser, like I mentioned before. Uh, you can write JavaScript and CSS. Uh, I was asking about games. You can write games for it. Uh, but I'm going to walk through some basic like media stuff. Uh, but just you know, you can you can write games and things just as easily uh, on the dongle as well. Um, so the receiver, uh, we start with. I'll start talking about two very, very simple receivers. One's a default receiver. You don't have to do any registration. Uh, you can just go in there and use it uh, right away. It plays basic media types like MP4s. I believe it even does HLS. But uh, things that aren't DRM'd and you don't really want to write any code, you just want to get something up and running really, really easy. Uh, the next receiver that we have is the styled media receiver. Uh, the styled media receiver uh, is basically we wrote all the JavaScript for you, and you can provide a basic CSS that allows you to style it, and you can play a lot more supported formats. And so here's an example of a styled receiver, and you can see you're able to style the progress bar, uh, you're able to style the splash screen, uh, there's a logo that's covered up that you can style as well. And so you can make it look and feel like your app, and all you did was provide a few basic CSS uh, tags to do that. Uh, now I want to talk about custom receivers, right? So custom receivers are where you're going out there, you're writing all the HTML, JavaScript, CSS yourself, uh, so that you can have a really immersive experience, you can customize things, uh, you can add metrics, you can do all the different things that you want to do. Whoops. Hang on. I just unplugged myself. There we go. Sorry about that. We'll do that again. Uh, so these are custom receivers. And most people who have you know, DRM'd content, uh, you know, any kind of protected content, or they're trying to do something more sophisticated, uh, they'll use custom receivers. So most of the apps, or all the apps that, that you've kind of heard of, the HBO, the Hulu, the Netflix, this is uh, what they do. So here's a really, really simple um, custom receiver. And you can see in just a few lines of code, uh, you can get something up and running. Um, so the first thing you'll do is create a web page and just include one script tag. Uh, so this is our cast receiver JS that has uh, the basic um, SDK in it. And then you'll create one media element. So you can see here that I've got a video tag. So I put a single video tag on the page. And then I'm going to create a media manager and pass it that, that video tag. So the media manager will take care of uh, dealing with with the content in that, in that video tag. And then finally, I'll get an instance of the receiver manager and start it. And so this is all it takes um, in Chrome you know, to write 
uh, code in the Chromecast in the receiver for a very, very simple um, experience, right? There's all kinds of callbacks that you can register. We won't go into all those today, but you can register listeners uh, to hear when people join and leave. Uh, you can get listeners when videos stop playing and paused and all that. Uh, but here's the basic uh, that it takes to, to get up and running. Next, I want to talk about custom messages, right? So we have two types of custom messages. Um, and so let's kind of imagine the scenario where we're writing a poker game, right? If I were going to write a poker game on Chromecast, uh, I'd like to show all the face-up cards, and then I'd also have face-down cards. So for face-up cards, I would use a message bus and send them out to everyone in the room. But for face down cards, I would use a cash channel so that I can send something in a point to point fashion uh, to one individual recipient. Um, so basically, your receiver, the code in the TV, can send out to everyone or just a single person, right? The senders, on the other hand, uh, the Android, the iPhone, or the web browser, they can only send to the receiver. So if, the, if a sender does need to broadcast something, He'll send a point-to-point -point message to the, to the television, and then it will broadcast it out to everyone. So the custom receivers have a few basic classes that I can talk about here. Uh, they have a, a cast receiver manager, uh, which is a singleton for uh, communications. Uh, there's a media manager, which is about loading media sessions uh, in your media element. Uh, you have the message bus in the channel that we just talked about that are all about doing custom messages, right? Either in a, in a bus fashion where it goes out to everyone or in a channel fashion where it goes out point to point on a single channel. Uh, like I talked about, it's not just about media apps, right? So a lot of the apps that are out there today are very media centric. And so for developers, I think this is a huge opportunity uh, to go out there, create things like games or other things. Um, you know, I know that we've got a few like fitness apps out there. Like that's another great experience where leveraging the television is, is a great opportunity. Um, and, and bringing together the second screen um, is really, really great. And so if you have other kinds of apps out there or web pages out there um, where this makes sense, don't just think about uh, video content. Uh, now I want to just kind of wrap things up, talk a little bit about development, kind of how you can get started with Chromecast. Um, and the first thing I want to talk about is the developer console. So when folks want to go out there and, and, and do work with Chromecast, the first thing they need to do is, is register their application. So it's a, it's a self-service console where folks can go out, uh, cast, google.com slash publish. You can go out and register your application. And from there, you can manage your various apps. And so you can have apps that are in a, a development state uh, where they can be seen by your QA team or members of your team, but can't be seen by everyone in the world. Right? And then finally, you can authorize devices, like I talked about, the devices owned by you and your company, and allow them access to debug your app where others around the world who you don't know, who are just your users, they're not able to debug your application. <coughs> now I we'll talk a little bit about um, sort of what you need to do as a developer. So Chromecast in nature is a very anonymous system. When users are using uh, Chromecast, we don't really know which device it's coming from. We don't really know information about that device. And so as a developer, we talked about whitelisting that needs to be done um, so that you can, you know, so that you can debug into your application, right? And so to do that, you need to go into the setup app and check a box that says, please send my serial number. And what this does is it makes your sender and, and the communication with your Chromecast no longer be anonymous so we know who you are and so that we can make a decision whether or not you're allowed um, to debug a particular application. Um, after you've done that, you can go to the IP address of the Chromecast in port 9222, and then you get all the Chrome remote debugging features uh, so that you can actually use Chrome uh, in, your, in your laptop or your desktop to debug the code um, that's running in the dongle. So it's a really nice uh, experience. So now let's talk more about debugging, 
right? So once you've got your device set up to where it can be um, debugged, um, here in Android, uh, you can see uh, a cast options. There's a little builder pattern there uh, where you can set, turn on verbose logging. And so this is all that needs to be done. And then you get all kinds of things in LogCat uh, that tell you a lot more information about when connections happen, disconnecting, uh, all that. And those are for Android developers. Uh, for iOS developers, uh, we have a GCK log delegate, which I don't even see on the screen, but uh, it basically has a, a log method, a log from function method, uh, that you can, you can configure what happens with logging. Uh, say, for example, you want to send your logs of a device to your server and things like that. It gives you the, the flexibility to do that. And then in Chrome Sender, it's all real straightforward. If you haven't used the Chrome Dev Tools, uh, they're really, really nice, uh, similar to Firebug that was super popular many years ago. Um, but uh, this is uh, how you can kind of do that there. And then obviously debugger command is another really cool little tag that many people don't use that forces a breakpoint. So it's kind of fun. <coughs> Receiver debugging is, is really cool because you can actually, like I said, you can use the Chrome remote debugger and then using it, uh, you can debug into your receiver. So has anyone ever used a Chrome remote debugging before? No, a few, a few. What'd you guys use it for? For Android, absolutely. So this is really, really cool. So if you do web development and you have an Android web app out there that like has janky scroll performance or your pages aren't loading on Android, uh, you can actually use your laptop through ADB and connect to your Android phone, and then you can remote debug. You can get a console, and you can put breakpoints, and you can modify the CSS live, whatever it is you want to do um, of that. And so it's a super powerful tool um, for folks trying to do mobile web development. I think it's really about the only tool out there. Uh, it actually works really, really well. Um, so before I joined Google, I had a lot of experience using it. And, uh, was, was really great. <coughs> so here's some of the things you can do. Um, setting the log level, and there's a constant there. You set it to debug level. Uh, and this will give you a lot more information about connecting and reconnecting. Um, and then you can do a window location reload with a true to tell it to clear the cache. So if you've changed code and you want to force it onto the device, you can do this. But I actually found it's a lot faster to power cycle the app. And so I have my USB real close because it doesn't do a clean shutdown, and so it's faster. Um, and so in development, I, I tend to, to yank the power cord and put it back in. So just a tip and trick there. And the debugger manual breakpoints are super awesome. If you haven't used those before, it's really, really nice because it'll stop right where you want. You can inspect things, and then you, it's, I, I like it better than breakpoints in a lot of cases. Cool. So now let's talk about some resources. You know, where can you go from here? Um, so we have the, all the documentation is on developergoogle.com slash cast. Um, the design check is, uh, there's a URL for that. Uh, the developer console. And finally, if you do have questions, Stack Overflow is a great place. So at Google, we're super supportive of Stack Overflow, and that's our hash, google-cast. Tons of questions. We have a team of people who monitor that every other day or maybe even every day um, and answers tons and tons of questions. Um, we have some really great samples on GitHub. Uh, the first one here that's listed, the cast videos, is designed to be something that's, that's more realistic. So it's, it's very complex. It uh, you know, adheres to the UX guideline. And so that's really that super advanced app. And hopefully you can grab as much code as possible from it to give you a head start. Uh, just grab as much as you can. And then there's two other simpler apps. One is Hello Video and Hello Text. And this is what's the bare minimum amount of code to get a video playing on the screen, or what's the bare, min bare minimum amount of code to send custom messages. Uh, so those two are really great just to get you started, kind of understand the basic life cycle before you dive into the more complex um, example. We've got some other samples on the receiver side. Uh, there's a media server, it's a Node.js server that lets you create your own HLS streams and, and pipe those out. Uh, there's a test harness for that. 
Um, and then there's a, a, a really complex uh, custom receiver that deals with all the after five minutes of delay. We're going to cycle through photos so you don't have burn in. Uh, deals with using our custom media player so you can do MPEG dash or HLS kind of video streams. Uh, it's a really great example to kind of get you up and started. So where should you go from here um, to get started? Uh, go to the web page, the Google Cast developer website. Uh, you can run through kind of a, a, a flow, uh, a workflow for Cinder apps and another flow chart for receiver apps. Uh, go get the sample apps from GitHub. Uh, get them up and running. Make sure that all your devel development environment's set up. You can debug and then modify them slightly to play some of the streams that you have. Uh, and then from there, uh, read through the design guideline. I recommend reading that once or twice, uh, maybe three times, so you really get a feel for all the things that can be done with, with Chromecast. It's a, it's a good, uh, it, it really helps you understand the full second screen uh, experiences. And with that, happy casting, and thanks everybody for coming out. Yeah, question. Yes. Um, do you, uh, will Chromecast work with uh, Google Earth yet? I have no idea. I've um, never tried. Is it is Google Earth Flash or? It may not have enough processing. So, Chromecast is is really limited in memory. So memory, you know, when you're doing things that are highly animated, um, definitely a memory constrained device because of thirty-five dollar price point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we're always improving the device, right? So the device gets better and better uh, over time, um, you know, both software and hardware. Uh, then there's also, you know, the whole Android TV. All the Android TVs will, I would assume, be much greater horsepower uh, than what this machine is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. Uh, I'm not, but if you send me an email, and there's a, I got a card here, you can grab one. If you send me an email, I'll definitely shoot slides over to you. Yeah. Any other questions? No? Very good. We'll enjoy the rest of the show.